Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, pain and analgesic drugs. Okay, so let me outline then the structure for this video. What we're going to start off with is a few definitions associated with pain. Okay, so we'll look at what the definition of acute pain is, what the definition of chronic pain is. We'll also look at the difference between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. And we'll also talk about the fact that for nociceptive pain, it can either be caused by a stimulus that is potentially going to cause tissue damage, or it can be caused by the actual ongoing tissue damage, basically the presence of tissue damage. Okay, uh, so those, that's what we'll do firstly. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll start an in-detailed study of nociceptors. Okay, uh, so uh, we will start with uh, looking at the actual nociceptors themselves, and then we'll look at the receptors that are uh, present within nociceptors, which allows them to respond uh, to noxious stimuli. Okay, so we'll look at the different receptors present there. Then what we'll do is we'll look at how the primary nociceptive neurons enter the spinal cord, and we'll look at the neurons which they then synapse onto in the spinal cord. Then we'll look at the spinothalamic tract, how the information is relayed up to the brain, and then what happens when it actually gets to the brain. Okay, then what we'll do is we will go on to inflammatory pain, which is the type of pain that is caused by an ongoing tissue injury. Okay, so tissue has been damaged. Okay, inflammation ensues, and that causes pain. That uh, injured tissue is going to have a chronic sort of pain uh, going up to the brain, or rather I should say a continuous pain rather than a chronic pain, because when we come to the definition of chronic pain, it's something quite different, basically. Okay, uh, then uh, what we will do is whilst we look at inflammatory pain, uh, we'll look at some key mediators of inflammatory pain such as prostaglandins, bradykinin and nerve growth factor. Uh, we'll also then introduce a major class of analgesics which are the non-steroid or anti-inflammatory drugs, the NZs. Okay. Um, then after we've looked at inflammatory pain, what we'll then do is we'll look at some other um, analgesic drugs. So we'll look at local anesthetics uh, and we'll also look at opiates and how they work. And then finally we'll turn our attention onto neuropathic pain and we'll look at drug treatments for neuropathic pain. Okay, right. So let's start off then with some basic definitions uh, regarding uh, pain. Okay, so let's start off with what the definition of pain actually is. So basically, the definition of pain is that it is a conscious experience, okay? So it is the actual unpleasant conscious experience, okay, um, which we get when uh, we are presented with a stimulus that could cause potential tissue damage or we actually have a damaged tissue, okay? So it's... It, Pain refers to the unpleasant experience. It's an unpleasant sensory and also emotional experience. There is an, em an emotional component to pain. It's unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. But the key thing that you have to understand there is that pain refers to the experience, okay? It's something that's on a much grander scale to just the transduction of noxious stimuli into action potentials. You know, this involves a huge amount of processing in the brain that isn't understood, okay? Um, so it's on a much grander scale than another concept, which is just nociception, okay? This, so this is unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So that's what pain is. Okay, it refers to that unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that follows actual tissue damage or the potential for tissue damage stimuli, which can potentially cause tissue damage. Okay, right. So two more definitions that we're going to uh, need um, are what is acute pain? What's meant by acute pain and how that's different from chronic pain? So what are the definitions of acute pain and chronic pain? Okay, so... The definition of acute pain, then, is that it's pain, this unpleasant sensory and emotional experience, that has lasted for less than 12 weeks, 
Okay, so acute pain has lasted for less than 12 weeks, whereas chronic pain has lasted for greater than 12 weeks. Okay, so that's the difference between acute and chronic pain uh, by definition. So this is acute pain, and this is then chronic pain. Okay, right. Uh, so next up, the next definitions I want are the difference between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Okay, so let me tell you about these. So nociceptive pain is pain that is produced by activating nociceptors, which we will come on to in a moment. Okay, so let me get rid of that S. So nociceptive pain is pain that's produced by activating peripheral nociceptors, which are the little things which sense, little sensory apparatuses, which sense uh, noxious stimuli in the peripheral body, in the soft tissues generally, so skin, uh, muscle, that sort of thing. Okay, whereas neuropathic pain is pain that is caused by damage to the neurons which transmit uh, the uh, signal from the nociceptors to the brain. So neuropathic pain is caused not by the activation of the nociceptors, but because there are problems with neurons that transmit the information from the nociceptors to the brain. And that can also cause this unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And generally, neuropathic pain leads to a chronic pain state, okay, uh, where it lasts for a very, very, very long time. Okay, whereas nociceptive pain uh, usually lasts for acute periods unless there is something very, very wrong with the way that the nociceptors are functioning. Okay, right. Uh, so that's nociceptive pain versus neuropathic pain. Uh, the final thing that I want to say is within nociceptive pain, which is this pain that is caused by the activation of the nociceptors, there are two different parts to nociceptive pain. Okay, so there is nociceptive pain which is caused by stimuli which have the potential to cause tissue damage. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Okay, well let me give you some examples. Okay, so for instance, if someone punches your arm, uh, that is a stimulus. When the punch is actually being delivered, that is a stimulus that could potentially cause tissue damage. And when they actually punch your arm, you get pain. Okay, that pain is occurring because of this stimulus that has the potential to cause tissue damage. Okay, uh, another example of a stimulus that has the potential to cause uh, tissue damage would be a hot object applied to the skin. Okay, so both of these stimuli here, these have the potential to cause tissue damage, even though when they're first applied, they haven't yet actually caused tissue damage. So, some pain can be caused by uh, things that have the potential to cause tissue damage, such as uh, punches or hot objects. Okay, whereas other pains are caused by actual tissue damage. So if you have actually suffered some terrible injury or potentially you have an infection in a certain portion of tissue and the tissue is actually damaged, okay, this can also cause pain basically. Okay, and it's important to distinguish between these two different uh, phenomena. Okay, we're going to start off by looking at how these stimuli which signal well, which could cause potential tissue damage, where, how those are actually going to cause pain, okay, because that, that's, the, understanding that is simpler to understanding this, we will come on to this later on, okay, and the pain that is caused by tissue damage is also called inflammatory pain, because when a tissue is damaged, either by an injury or due to infection, uh, you generally get an inflammatory process occurring, and therefore the inflammatory process is what's driving the pain. Okay, so we will come on to discussing inflammatory pain later on. So firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the pain that arises from these stimuli which have the potential to cause tissue damage, such as punches or hot objects or extremely cold objects as well, uh, which could potentially cause tissue damage, although when you first apply them, they haven't yet caused tissue damage, and that's the important distinction between these two, okay? Right, uh, so uh, let's now talk then 
about the difference between pain and nociception. So I mentioned uh, earlier on when we were defining pain that there was a, another term that people often get confused with, what the difference between pain and nociception is. Okay, so I've told you that pain is that conscious, uh, sensory and emotional experience uh, which uh, accompanies this actual tissue damage or this potential uh, stimulus which could cause tissue damage. Okay, nociception is a more easy thing to understand. Pain is a much grander scale thing. That's something that, you know, it's out of our minds to even imagine how pain is caused. We don't understand consciousness at all, okay? So we can't understand really what pain is because it's something that has to occur by a huge amount of processing from the brain to actually make a conscious experience, okay? But nociception is something that we do understand. Nociception is merely the transduction of noxious stimuli into action potentials. So transduction of noxious stimuli into action potentials in special sensory devices called nociceptors. Okay, so transduction of noxious stimuli into action potentials. So making noxious stimuli activate uh, action potential firing within a special sensory structure known as a nociceptor. Okay, so into, I'll just put APs for action potentials. Okay, so understand the difference between nociception and pain. Nociception refers to the fact that we are going to have special uh, sensory uh, nerve endings which are going to be detecting noxious stimuli. And a noxious stimuli is just a stimulus that has the potential, potentially, to cause pain. Okay, and these noxious stimuli are going to be activating certain receptors on the surface of these uh, nociceptors. And I'll put that word there now because we're going to need that. We're going to be using that throughout the entire video. Okay, a nociceptor is the, the sensory apparatus that is at the end of certain neurons, okay? So, um, we have, you know, there's mechanoreceptors, uh, which are, th th for instance, Pacinian corpuscles at the end of sensory uh, nerves, okay? A nociceptor is a device at the end of certain sensory nerves, uh, which can be activated by all sorts of noxious stimuli, okay? So it's the end portion of sensory nerves, which is receptive to noxious stimuli. Okay, so nociception is the process of noxious stimuli being transduced into action potentials within these nociceptors. Okay, now that's very different from pain. As I say, pain is something on the level of the entire brain. It's this conscious experience which is very unpleasant, okay, which has both a sensory and emotional component. Okay, right. And really to highlight the difference between uh, nociception and pain, uh, we can look at, for instance, the fact that you can have nociception without having pain. So, for instance, soldiers uh, who are in wars, generally they don't feel pain um, due to injuries that they have even though nociception is still occurring. So even though the nociceptors are all the time generating action potentials, they don't actually get the pain, uh, they don't get the conscious experience because they are in such a threatening situation. And we will look potentially at the mechanism that underlies that later on when we come on to the way that opiates work. Okay, um, but the point is that you can have nociception, you can have the transduction of noxious stimuli into action potentials without actually having the conscious experience of pain generated. Okay, so the two are very separate. One is very, very easy to understand and we have a decent understanding of it. The other, which is the thing that occurs on the level of the entire brain, we don't understand at all. And I'm certainly not going to be able to explain to you how uh, you actually generate the conscious unpleasant experience. I wish I could, but I can't. Right, okay, so we're going to start off then with a study of these nociceptors, okay, which are these endings of certain sensory nerves, okay, and we're going to see how there are three main different populations of nociceptors. There is a fourth one as well, uh, and we'll look at those four different types of nociceptors and then what we'll move on to is looking at the actual receptors that these nociceptors have which can transduce um, 
noxious stimuli into action potentials, basically. Well, first into receptor potentials, which will then cause action potentials. Okay, so, nociceptors then. I want to stress that the nociceptor is just the ending of a sensory neuron. Okay, so it's not the name for the entire sensory neuron. The entire sensory neuron is known as a primary nociceptive afferent. Okay? And it's going to have its cell body in the dorsal root ganglia, as we'll see later. Okay, so a primary nociceptive afferent. So if I draw one of these primary nociceptive afferents, basically their structure looks like so. Here is the cell body of a primary nociceptive afferent. Then they have a single process coming off their cell body. And then this single process splits into two separate uh, processes. One that will go into the central nervous system. And therefore, this one is called the central process. And we'll see the exact position of the cell body later on. But for now, uh, we'll just talk about the basic structure of this primary nociceptive afferent. So here is the central process, which will go into the central nervous system. And then it has another process, which is the peripheral process here, which will go off and innovate some peripheral tissue. Okay, so the idea then is that at the end of this peripheral process, you can have a structure known as a nociceptor, okay, uh, which is a specialized structure at the end of the uh, primary nociceptive afferent, which is capable of transducing noxious stimuli into action potentials, which will fire up the peripheral process and then on to the central process, and then you'll release neurotransmitter onto some secondary neuron, which will be within the spinal cord, and we'll see that secondary neuron later on. Okay, so that's the important thing to understand, that the nociceptor does not mean the entire primary nociceptive afferent. It just means the apparatus at the end of the peripheral process of the primary nociceptive afferent, which is capable of actually transducing noxious stimuli into first the receptor potentials and then action potentials. Okay, so uh, which uh, tissues actually have nociceptive uh, neurons having their axon terminals there? Okay, so which tissues actually have nociceptors present within them? Okay, well, the key ones are the skin has nociceptors within it. Okay, uh, in addition, the muscle has t um, um, nociceptors within it, skeletal muscle, I mean there. Okay, so I might just put that in. So skeletal muscle, all right? And um, also the joints have nociceptors in. Okay, we'll see also that some of the viscera have nociceptors in, but they have a special type of nociceptor in that is not normally activated. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a moment. These ones have normal nociceptors. So we'll come back to the viscera in a moment. Okay, so the example that we'll look at is the skin because it's the easiest to draw here. Okay, so let me draw you a little picture of the skin then. So I'll draw the epidermis, which is the outer layer of the skin here, like so. And remember the junction between the epidermis and the portion of the skin below the epidermis is not just flat, it's um, waggly like this, wavy. Okay, so this is the epidermis, this is the outermost layer of the skin. So this is the outside world here, this is where air would be. And this is the outer layer of your skin. So I'll colour in the epidermis in a special colour. So here in yellow, this is uh, the epidermis. Okay, and then the layer of the skin underneath the epidermis is what's known as the dermis. Okay, which is a thicker layer than the epidermis here. So this is the dermis. And as I pointed out previously, the junction between the dermis and the epidermis is not flat, but instead is wavy, like so. And these sort of extensions of the dermis upwards, these are what are known as reti ridges. Okay, so that's a reti ridge. And then the complementary extensions of the epidermis downwards, like here, are known as reti pegs. Okay? So you have reti pegs and reti ridges perfectly complementary, sort of slotting the epidermis and the dermis together. Okay, now, uh, nociceptors are located within the dermis. Let me show one of these. So here comes the peripheral process of our primary nociceptive afferent. And then at the end of it, it will branch into potentially many little branches here. And all of these will be specialized nociceptors. So this is a nociceptor, this ending of the peripheral process. 
And again, all of these little endings uh, will be capable of transducing um, noxious stimuli into receptor potentials and then action potentials. Okay, right. So, uh, that's a nociceptor going to the skin then. Okay, so what we now want to talk about is the fact that there are three major types of nociceptors. We can divide nociceptors into three major types. Some people divide them into far more types than this, okay? Uh, but we'll divide them into three major types to simplify it down. Okay, so firstly, there are the thermal nociceptors, okay? And these are nociceptors which just sense extremes in temperature. Okay, so either they will sense uh, too hot or too cold, and I should say here, these nociceptors, they don't sense too hot or too cold, they sense both of them. Okay, so one nociceptor will be able to sense extreme hot and also extreme cold, so the ending of this single uh, peripheral uh, process of this primary nociceptive afferent, let's say it is one of these thermal nociceptors, it will be able to sense both too hot and too cold, okay, and that's why, actually, when you do get too cold, it usually feels like burning, okay, so for instance, if you've played in the snow, you'll know how much fun it is for about 10 minutes, and then once the snow actually sort of makes its way through your gloves and your hands become bitterly cold, then you are actually feeling nociceptive cold, okay, an extreme of cold. And what does it feel like? It feels like your hands are burning, okay, which is kind of contradictory, but that's what it feels like. It feels as though it's burning, and one of the reasons for that is that um, th these neurons, these thermal nociceptors, they sense both too hot and too cold. So when this nociceptor becomes active and an action potential is fired up this primary uh, nociceptive afferent peripheral process, you don't know whether that's because um, it, it's too hot, basically, or whether it's too cold. Okay, so the brain can't tell the difference between too hot and too cold, basically, using just this uh, primary afferent uh, here. Okay, and that's why uh, too cold feels similar to too hot, basically, or at least one of the reasons why too cold feels similar to too hot. Okay, so, what then are the extremes of temperature? Well, generally, too hot is greater than 45 degrees Celsius. Okay, so if this, these three endings here uh, become heated up to greater than 45 degrees Celsius, then they'll start to generate action potentials. Alternatively, too cold is less than 5 degrees Celsius. So if these free endings are cooled down to below 5 degrees Celsius, then they'll uh, fire the action potentials as well. Okay, right. Now, the other thing to say about thermal nociceptors, then, is that they are attached, the nociceptor here, and I'll just stress this, this is the nociceptor here, okay, the ending here, um, they are attached to primary nociceptive afferents which have a certain fibre type, okay, which I'll explain in just a moment after I've uh, labelled this up as the nociceptor. Okay, right, so n n thermal nociceptors which sense only too hot and too cold, they are attached to primary nociceptive afferents which are a certain fiber type, and this certain fiber type is known as an A delta fiber. So let me tell you what the characteristic of an A delta fiber is, and this now is referring to this portion here, the uh, axon of the primary nociceptive afferent with this thermal nociceptor at the end of it. Okay, right, so the characteristic then of A delta fibers is that they have quite a thick diameter, at least compared to the other fibers that we're going to see later on. Okay, and their diameter is usually around 5 micrometers. Okay, so that, this is the axon I'm drawing here. Okay, so these are the two cell membranes, and then you've got the axoplasm, which is just the cytoplasm inside an axon uh, within uh, the bounds of these two membranes. Okay, and they're also thinly myelinated, so they do have myelin sheaths around them. Okay, like so. So here's some myelin surrounding this axon, and I'll cover this myelin, sorry, cover this myelin in orange here. Okay, right, so this is the characteristics of an A-delta fibre. They are uh, thinly myelinated, 
okay, and they also uh, have a diameter of around 5 micrometers. Okay, now, uh, this means that they conduct action potentials at a reasonable speed, because remember, having these myelin sheaths allows the action potential to just jump from one node of Rambier to the next node of Rambier. It can effectively skip uh, this portion, which has the myelin sheaf around. So it jumps from one node of Rambier, which is this portion in between two uh, sheaths that is not myelinated. So this is a node of Rambier. And basically, the action potential can then jump uh, from here to here because basically the sodium ions um, that have come into the cytoplasm here uh, at this last portion, which is undergoing the action potential, can just diffuse right the way through here and then induce an action potential over here. So it means that you don't have to propagate it one little bit of membrane at a time. Instead, it can jump from here to here. And that hugely speeds up the conduction of the action potentials along that axon. Okay, right, and that means that action potentials along this axon are conducted at speeds between 5 and 30 meters per second. Okay, so the important thing to understand here is that these are the fast ones, okay, for nociceptors. Nociceptors generally are attached to axons of two different types, okay, so primary nociceptive afferents with two different types of axons. A delta is one, and the other is going to be C fibers. Okay, and C fibers are much thinner, they're not myelinated, and they're much slower in conducting action potentials. So the important thing to take from this is that these thermal nociceptors are attached to primary nociceptive afferents, which are going to conduct action potentials quickly, as far as a nociceptor is concerned. Okay, because nociceptors can't be attached, or at least then. Yeah, for simple re for the purposes of simplifying this down, we will say they can't be attached to larger neurons than this with faster conduction velocities. It's not quite true, but it's almost true. Okay, right. Uh, so um, th that's the thermal nociceptors then attached to these A delta fibers. The next type of nociceptor that I want to talk about are mechanical nociceptors. Okay, and these uh, detect pressure, intense pressure applied to the skin, so mechanical nociceptors. So again, the picture is exactly the same as previously. Okay, and I might just redraw that picture out again uh, because it's so important. Here's the epidermis, okay, here's the dermis, and then we've got our peripheral process of our primary nociceptive afferent here branching out with loads of little free endings like so, and this great big ending here, this is the nociceptor. And now, uh, these free endings are going to detect intense pressure, if this is going to be a mechanical nociceptor. Okay, so intense pressure applied to the skin. Right. Okay, now again, um, these mechanical nociceptors which detect intense pressure, they are going to be attached to primary nociceptive afferents, which are of the A delta type. Okay, so this fiber which this nociceptor is attached to is again going to be an A delta fiber. So a reminder of the key um, statistics there, 5 micrometers in diameter, thinly myelinated, a conduction velocity between 5 and 30 meters per second. Okay, right, so those are mechanical nociceptors, and again you'll find them in the skeletal muscle, the skin, and the joints. Okay, right, the next type of uh, nociceptor we're going to talk about is very different, okay? This is what's known as the polymodal nociceptor, okay? And this can detect all sorts of different um, noxious stimuli, okay? So I might draw a separate picture for it here. Oh, and I've forgotten to do the waviness of the uh, boundary between the epidermis and the dermis, how terrible. Right, there we go. There's the dermis. And then again, we've got our uh, primary nociceptive afferents peripheral process here, and then we've got the actual nociceptor here with all of these free endings. Right, now polymodal nociceptors can detect all sorts of different noxious stimuli. Okay, so they can detect the thermal stimuli, Okay, both too hot and too cold, again, so greater than 45 degrees Celsius is too hot, okay, less than 5 degrees Celsius is too cold, okay, so they'll be activated by the extremes of temperature, they will also be uh, receptive to mechanical stimuli, okay, so they'll be, uh, they'll be 
stimulated by too intense pressure that's applied to the skin. Okay, and now there's some additional things that they'll be stimulated by. They'll also be stimulated by chemical stimuli. Okay, uh, so uh, things such as too high proton concentration, okay, or too acidic environment, basically. Okay, so things like low pH. So if the extracellular fluid has got a too high proton concentration, i.e. a too low pH, then these fibers will also be activated. In addition, which will become important later, they can be activated by things like ATP. And ATP is released by cells when they're damaged. ATP, remember, is the biological energy currency. It's a molecule which stores energy, and you can hydrolyze it to release energy. Okay, now ATP is usually uh, kept to the cytoplasm. It's an incredibly important molecule, and it's kept within the cytoplasm. So if you've got ATP floating around in the extracellular fluid, it's not a good sign. It's a sign, basically, that cells have burst open. Okay, so it's a sign of tissue damage. Okay, so again, uh, ATP often activates these polymodal nociceptors. Okay, so these polymodal nociceptors, they're activated by a huge number of different noxious stimuli, hence why they are called polymodal nociceptors. Poly means many, modal uh, kind of refers to what they're activated by, so activated by loads of different things is what their name implies. Okay, now, these polymodal nociceptors, they are generally attached to primary nociceptive afferents with a different type of fiber. Okay, so they're not going to be attached to A-delta fibers anymore. Okay, instead, they are going to be attached to primary nociceptive afferents which have C fibers. Okay, so polymodal nociceptors are going to be attached to C fibers. So now, what are the characteristics then of a C fiber? So let me draw a C fiber out here, and we'll compare it to an A delta fiber. So C fiber primary nociceptive afferents have extremely thin diameters. Okay, so the diameter of a C fiber is usually around one micrometer, so a fifth of the diameter of a A delta fiber. Okay, uh, they also uh, do not have myelin, so they're unmyelinated. Now, the lack of myelin means that when you conduct an action potential along this C fiber, the action potential has to propagate every single step of the way. It has to regenerate itself continuously. Okay, and that's a slower process, which means that these C fibers conduct action potentials at a slower velocity. So their conduction velocity is usually around one meter per second, which still isn't bad, because action potentials, you know, even when they do have to continuously regenerate themselves all the way along, it's still a fast process, okay? So rotated reconduction is fast. Okay, so um, these polymodal nociceptors, then, they are attached to these C fibers rather than the A delta fibers, okay? And that's a key distinguishing feature between the separates the thermal and mechanical nociceptors, which are only sensing specific types of noxious stimuli. So the thermal nociceptors only sense the extremes of temperature, the mechanical nociceptors only sense the extremes of pressure, and then the polymodal nociceptors sense a huge number of different noxious stimuli, and they're attached to these different fibre types. Okay, now, uh, there's an important uh, point about this, which is that this can explain a phenomenon known as first and second pain. Okay, so let me explain what first and second pain is all about. Okay, so, let's say that you get, um, that, let's say that you bang a hammer on your thumb, okay? The first pain that you get is an incredibly sharp and intense pain, and this arrives incredibly quickly. So the first pain that you get, which is just called the first pain, is a very sharp, intense pain, okay? And this is going to be due to the activation of uh, the mechanical nociceptors and the conduction along A delta fibers. Okay, so when you bash your thumb with a hammer, that will uh, constitute intense pain, okay, uh, sorry, intense pressure, okay? So it will activate these mechanical nociceptors, and they will now generate action potentials which will propagate down the A delta fibers. Now, these A delta fibers conduct action potentials quicker than the C fibers, 
Okay, so this will arrive very quickly and that will cause the initial very sharp pain. Now, of course, the hammer's gone now, it's no longer bashing away. So these fibers will stop being active once the hammer has gone. Okay, so now they'll stop firing. Okay, I'm going to draw a little graph for this. What you'll get is if we have a pain here, this is time. Okay, and this is time in a few seconds, you know. Okay, the first burst of pain you get is very, very sharp, and that's caused by the arrival of the signals from the A delta fibers, which are connected to the pure mechanical nociceptors. Okay, then what will have also been activated by the intense mechanical stimulus is these polymodal nociceptors. Okay, and they'll be sending their stimuli down, uh, their signals rather, down the C fibers. Now, C fibers conduct more slowly than the A delta fibers, so it will take longer to get to the brain. So what you then get is the second pain portion, which is less intense, it's more dull and achy, and that's known as second pain. Okay, so this is more, uh, it's not as sharp and not as intense, it's duller. Okay, and that's caused by the C fibers. Okay, right, so this is the orange one here. Whoops. Okay, so that's second pain and first pain. Okay, then of course, if the hammer has actually done some tissue damage, which it probably will have, uh, then you'll start up uh, inflammatory pain. Okay, and inflammatory pain is usually mediated by the C fibers. Okay, so when you've actually got some tissue damage, what will happen is uh, until that tissue damage has been repaired, uh, what will be continuously firing are the C fibers, so C fibers will continuously be firing and this will cause a dull achy pain until the finger has repaired basically and this will go on for much much longer, you know. This was the first uh, bit that came because the actual uh, stimulus of the hammer causing the intense pressure which could cause tissue damage was there. So this is pain due to a potentially damaging stimulus, okay, so in that bit alone you do have this two separate divisions, the first pain and the second pain. And then long after this, you then have the inflammatory pain, which is due to the fact that the hammer might have caused some actual tissue damage. And that's generally mediated by the C fibers firing uh, at a continuous uh, rate, basically. Okay, and that causes the sort of dull ache uh, ar around the finger and makes you not use it in the way that you would usually use it to try and help uh, in the uh, repair of that uh, piece of tissue that has been damaged. Okay, so we'll talk about, as I say, inflammatory pain much, much later on and we'll look at how the C fibres remain active all the time. Okay, right. Uh, so the final type of nociceptor that I want to talk about, we've done the three main uh, type now, uh, types of nociceptor now, but I want to mention one final type, which is the type that uh, innovates um, the uh, viscera, okay? And these nociceptors are known as silent nociceptors, okay? Because they are not usually active even if you present them with a noxious stimulus, okay? So silent nociceptors. Okay, right, so these silent nociceptors, they are in the viscera, okay, so they're in the visceral organs, so for instance the liver, places like that, so they innervate the viscera, okay, and they are, they themselves are attached to C fibers, so if I draw one of these, here is the uh, peripheral process of the primary nociceptive afferent, and of course it will branch out to actually produce the free endings, which is the nociceptor. Okay, so this is the silent nociceptor here, and it's going to be attached to primary nociceptive afferents, which are C fibers. Okay, uh, and again, these silent nociceptors, okay, here, they are polymodal. They can detect all sorts of different stimuli when they are actually active. Okay, so again, they can detect thermal stimuli. Okay, they can detect mechanical stimuli and also chemical stimuli. Okay, however, they're not normally active. Whoops, chemical stimuli. Okay, so if you were to give mechanical uh, stimuli to a visceral organ, it wouldn't usually cause pain because these silent nociceptors aren't actually activatable under normal conditions. Instead, what happens is they become active under conditions of inflammation. So if that visceral organ 
has got an inflammatory process occurring inside it, then the nociceptors in that region um, where the inflammation process is occurring, they will then become activatable. And then thermal nociceptive uh, stimuli and mechanical nociceptive stimuli and also chemical nociceptive stimuli will then be able to actually activate those um, silent nociceptors and you'll get action potentials propagating up the C fibers and they will actually cause pain. Okay, so only when a process of inflammation is occurring and there's all sorts of inflammatory uh, mediators in the uh, tissue fluid will you actually be able to get the activation of these silent nociceptors. Okay, right, so that's an overview of the different types of nociceptors now. Uh, what we will turn our attention to in the next video is we'll look at the different receptors that these nociceptors can have within their cell membranes, which are actually capable of detecting the noxious stimuli and uh, producing receptor potentials in response to that.